Welcome to episode 28 of the G2 on 5G. It's the latest inside scoop on everything 5G, and it's brought to you by More Insights and Strategy. We're going to cover six topics in about 15 minutes. And this week, joining me again is Anshul Saad. So let's get started. My first topic this week is SK Telecom. And uh, I wrote a Forbes article, did some research about a little over a year ago. And one of the, uh, one of the focuses was on uh, global carrier leadership. And I pointed out SK Telecom as a leader. And this week they reported soaring profits. So they added over 900,000 5G subs in the latest quarter, kind of looking at my notes here, and 44.2% um, uh, year over year profit improvement. And they are pointing to 5G as a tremendous catalyst. And it's no surprise. Um, you know, and, and you know, one of their secrets has been not just focusing on data access, but it's been on use case. So they've, they've rolled out some pretty innovative um, services, you know, from a consumer standpoint, and they have a lot of enterprise services in the ready. So any thoughts, Angel? Um, I think it's, it's pretty good. I mean, I, I think this quarter for a lot of companies, which we'll, we'll talk about later on, um, has been a very good quarter for a lot of companies related to 5G. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it just, you know, 5G has been out now for more than a year. And I think it just took time for these companies to start realizing uh, the benefits of rolling out their 5G networks and, you know, marketing to consumers and getting, you know, phone upgrades done and, and, and getting people on new rate plans. So it's been a process, but it, I think this is kind of, this Q3 was really the first quarter. I think people started to really see the benefits of, of deploying 5G on their balance sheets. Yeah, no, I would agree. And, you know, it also helps that, you know, with the latest uh, iPhone uh, rollout uh, that they're supporting 5G. I know you're going to get into that, uh, I believe, during the podcast here. But, uh, yeah, I agree with you. I mean, it's the, the hype cycle has been out there for, for quite a while. And now we're just starting to see the effect of all that coming through. And, um, it'll, it'll be great to see, you know, how the U.S. operators do. I know you're going to talk about T-Mobile uh, with your first topic, but um, yeah, it's pretty exciting. So that's a great segue. Um, you want to talk about Qualcomm and T-Mobile earnings. Yeah, so uh, Qualcomm had earnings yesterday. T-Mobile had earnings today. Um, and both, shock, also pointed to 5G being a big component of their, you know, gangbusters earnings. Mm -hmm. um, so T-Mobile reported uh, an earnings per share of a dollar per share, which is double what everybody is expecting, which is huge. Wow. Yeah. And their revenue beat both their and uh, consensus estimates. And so was their EBITDA. So they were like, they were ahead on every metric. They just crushed it. Um, and I think I didn't actually check their share price after they announced, because that was about an hour ago, but mm -hmm. their, uh, their ticker is TMUS. Yeah, they're up 8% after hours. Oh, wow. So they, they popped. And then on, in addition to that, Qualcomm announced earnings yesterday, and they also had a gangbusters quarter, basically across all business segments, IoT, automotive, uh, smartphone, and they've actually split these out now uh, RFFE, which is RF front end, for those who don't know what that means. Um, mm -hmm. RF front end is basically all of the components that go, that sit between the modem and the antenna effectively. Um, mm -hmm. And in many cases, they also include the antenna. But it's all like the, you know, the analog components and some digital components to the, the, the chain of making that radio signal for 5G. So they saw huge, huge growth opportunities and, and actual profits in a basically all of those segments. Um, and you know, now their, their automotive pipeline is $8 billion. Wow. And a lot of that is, is obviously not quite 5G yet. Um, but my understanding is a lot of that is anticipating 5G growth in automotive. Mm -hmm. um, and they also saw some pop uh, from some of their partners having some pretty big growth numbers, which we'll be talking about in the future. Um, but this actually helped them wrap up their fiscal Q4 um, and they were able to increase revenue by 12% and profit by 11% for the fiscal year, which is pretty good considering COVID um, mm -hmm. and how a lot of companies have struggled. Um, but what's interesting, you know, going back to T-Mobile, 
is that they've also now officially cracked 100 million customers. So, um, you know, they they they're they're killing it on almost every every front, and you know, with their coverage, I think you know they're able to really convince people to switch. Uh, you know, they've got unlimited plans and they're pretty affordable. I'm personally a customer of T-Mobile, but I will say that you know I think T-Mobile has a long way to go in terms of improving 5G speeds and delivering you know on the promise of what 5G should be, which is yeah. low latency and high speeds as well as good coverage. And I think it's just gonna be a matter of time until that 2.5 gigahertz network rolls out. And until then, my box of T-Mobile layer cake is waiting. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they have all the ingredients, right, to, to be successful. They've got that impressive spectrum footprint with Sprint, we've talked about that before. Um, they, they're the first to deploy a standalone network. I learned today on a Nokia analyst call that Nokia has been involved in, in their standalone deployment. Um, so yeah, they're, they're, they're doing quite well as an operator. Qualcomm is frankly killing it. Um, they are driving the 5G ecosystem. We spoke about their, uh, their small cell announcement on the heels of their, of their, uh, their 5G summit that just happened, uh, that just wrapped up. And uh, that, that, that addressable market is only going to continue to increase for them from my perspective as they get into infrastructure. So, you know, be, per, you know playing on the end device, playing in the infrastructure, um, the future looks very, very bright for Qualcomm. Let's, uh, let's shift to my second topic this week. And I spoke about this on a prior podcast, uh, Mavenir, and, you know, their plans to launch an IPO. And I found that it was uh, it was interesting, probably fortuitous, given the momentum behind OpenRAM, but suddenly they've pulled back and they're pulling the plug on their IPO. No, you know, no, from my perspective, no real tangible reason other than they're saying market volatility. I find that interesting because they were planning to do this right around a presidential election. And yeah. as we know in the past, right, I mean, the markets are all over the place uh, and we don't even have a winner yet, official winner yet. Uh, but, you know, is there trouble in Open RAN paradise? I don't know. I mean, I, I've spoken about this before. Open RAN is not a slam dunk. I mean, there are lots of challenges. Certainly, it can be very CapEx disruptive. But at the same time, the complexity with the software integration um, is not easy. And we've seen that with Rakuten and some delays that they've had there as well. So um, I, I don't really buy it. I, I don't know if you've been following any of this, but do you have any thoughts? So I didn't follow the IPO, but there have been other IPOs that have been pulled recently. Yeah. Um, so honestly, I just think that like right now is a very weird time. I don't really buy, I forget what the justification was that they used. What, what did they see was the reasoning for them? Pulling? Market market volatility. Yeah, and it's like, I mean, there's, I a lot of IPOs, there's a lot of IPOs that have come out that had no issues, mm -hmm. um, like in the last few weeks. Because if you're a solid company with solid earnings and, and a solid future, you shouldn't have to worry about your IPO, even if the markets are volatile. Like I remember in March when things were bad, people were still IPOing. So, yeah. I mean, if you're a really solid company and people believe in your vision, it doesn't matter when you IPO. Obviously, there are better times, you know, but eventually long term, it, it, I think long term and implications are pretty insignificant. Yeah. So there's definitely something else going on there. Yeah, I, I believe there is too. So we'll, we'll see how that story plays out. So let's shift to your second topic. And you want to talk a little bit about um, smartphone market share. Yeah, so uh, last late last week, uh, there was a, an announcement from Canalis, uh, who's one of our, our, our partners at More Insights. Uh, and they provide a lot of market data that, um, you know, is very deep. And they were able to look at October 2020, which was Q3. Uh, and they were able to look at the numbers and see that Samsung had reclaimed the number one spot as a smartphone vendor in the world by shipping 80 million units, followed by Huawei with 51 million, and Xiaomi grew by a huge percentage to That's, find yeah, the Xiaomi. third place spot. I saw that. And Apple at number four, right? And Apple is now at number four and Vivo is a number five, which means Oppo got bumped out of the top five. Yeah. And what's interesting is if you look at the annual growth numbers uh, that Canalis has, they show Samsung growing 2%, Huawei shrinking 23%, and Xiaomi growing 45%. 
Is that well, based on the price point, Anshul, with Xiaomi? So Xiaomi, I would say, definitely has a very broad uh, available price point, price segment. And they have, you know, top end, they have the number one ranked camera phone on DXL Mark, but they also have some really great $200 phones. Wow. So I, I think Xiaomi is probably one of the few companies out there that can really deliver a 5G phone at almost any price category. Mm -hmm. uh, Samsung is getting there, but their price, their phones are still a bit more expensive than Xiaomi's and Xiaomi delivers great value. And part of the reason why Xiaomi does that is because they also earn a lot of money through their ecosystem, kind of like how Apple does. Yeah. But Apple captures a lot of profit on the phone itself as well. Yeah. So it's just interesting because Xiaomi kind of came out of nowhere for a lot of people. But mm -hmm. what is interesting is that Samsung and Xiaomi are both very big partners of Qualcomm. And I think they helped Qualcomm buoy their earnings. And, you know, mm -hmm. Apple shrinking 1% year on year doesn't look great, but you also have to account for the fact that Q3, there was no iPhone, new iPhone, and yeah. the 5G iPhone came out Q4, so a lot of people might have just been waiting for the new iPhone and didn't buy one in Q3, and I think we'll see very different Q4 numbers. I'm not sure Apple will make up those numbers, but they could because they're only about 4 million units apart, so yeah. I have a feeling Xiaomi may get bumped back down unless they continue their growth. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I would agree with you that um, I think there was, there was a lot of waiting, you know, for that, that 5G enabled iPhone and um, you know, and then, you know, it's interesting, you know, um, this mini form factor as well. You know, I think, you know, phones have been growing, 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 and now we're seeing some of these foldables like the Samsung flip that, um, that are a larger format, but you know, when you fold them, they're much more pocketable. I think, you know, there may be, you know, a trend or some, you know, subset of uh, consumers that want a, want a smaller form factor. So, um, you know, I know you, you cover the end devices. That's not my, my area, but I, I'm going to just throw a, you know, a guess out there that I, I think the, the iPhone mini is going to do quite well. I don't know. What oh, absolutely. I mean, yeah. one of the reasons why the iPhone mini will do so well is because it's a 5G phone and it, it's a no compromises 5G phone. You don't actually have to compromise on any features yeah. in order to get that compact size, which you pre previously have had to do with Apple. So I think that alone is going to be a big thing. Plus, it enter, you know it brings you into the iPhone at six at five ninety nine. Mm -hmm. But you get gotcha. the five G iPhone at five ninety nine. So not only is it smaller, it's also cheaper. So I, yeah. I really do think that's going to be their best seller for sure. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. I mean, yeah, that's a com that's a compelling price when you look at you know. The larger format iPhones that are that are north of a thousand US, right? So, yeah, so it'll be interesting. Let's keep tabs on that and uh, have you come back and, and give us an update when uh, when next quarter numbers break. So, let's uh, move to my third and final topic this week, and it's out of the UK. And Vodafone announced Vodafone UK announced that they're no surprise, you know, given uh, the UK's rip and replace effort of Huawei. Um, that they're going to replace Huawei with with Open RAN um, for 5G. Now, is this a risky move or are they a trailblazer? I don't know. I was talking about some of the risks, uh, pros and cons with uh, with Open RAN earlier in the podcast, but uh, this is pretty gutsy on their part. What do you think? Um, it is. I mean, to be fair, being a trailblazer is risky. Uh, I think they're doing it because they want competition and they want people to compete for their business yeah and it's much harder to do that when your options are ericsson nokia the yeah. and samsung right mm -hmm. but when you start adding all the other oran or the open ran sorry when you add all the open ran potential suppliers there's a little bit more competition on price and i think that's what they're looking for yeah yeah but you know, someone's going to have to integrate all that. And that's something traditionally that um, Ericsson and Nokia and Samsung and Huawei have been very good at. And it's like that one throat to choke, you know, and from a service, pers you know, service perspective as well. And with all the disaggregation going on, yeah, I mean, there's, it's great for leverage um, from, a, from a CapEx perspective, but then, you know, I don't believe Vodafone is going to do the integration. They're going to have to find a third party that can go do that. And then, you know, okay, if there if there's an issue in deploying, you know, the radio access network, 
whose throats are they going to have to go choke, you know, to go address that. But, you know, um, so, you know, I, I expected an operator was going to do it. I mean, there are lots of, you know, proof of concepts going on right now with every operator. I think every operator is looking at, a, a, at, a, at open RAM because it is very compelling. Um, but uh, from a cost perspective, but, uh, but it'll be interesting to see like their journey. And so I'll, I'll make sure to keep tabs on that and, you know, bring that back into a future podcast is uh, their, the, the details are, uh, are forthcoming. So let's shift to your final topic this week. And um, Samsung and KT announced a collaboration. Yeah, so Samsung partnered with KT to roll out their new core. So KT has a new standalone core, but it's a common core so that it shares uh, the core for 4G and 5G and Wi-Fi. So that way they can deploy one core for all types of connectivity for their customers. Mm -hmm. And in theory, it should save uh, time and money on both the automation as well as you know all the management that they need to do for their network. So they're they're they have basically you know one thing orchestrating every kind of connectivity. Obviously, it needs to be very high performance. Right. Uh, it's going to need to have a significant amount of flexibility. But it, it looks like KT is the first partner to to do this with Samsung, and it's going to allow them to roll 5G standalone pretty quickly. I I hope because yeah. unless you have 5G standalone and a lot of these use cases are just not going to happen. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. What's interesting, you mentioned standalone. So it supports 5G standalone and non-standalone and LTE, right? And um, so that's extremely, you know, flexible from, to your point, from an orchestration perspective, because 4G isn't going away anytime soon. I mean, 3G is still being supported and, you know, I, I imagine probably not as much in, in the, the Korean market, South Korean market as it is, and maybe, you know, developing, you know, sort of parts of the world, you know, Africa and, and you know, places like that. But um, yeah, it's, uh, it's quite interesting. And, uh, you know, I was surprised, you know, SK Telecom, I talked about them at the top of the podcast. They've been a real innovator and they've been, you know, very um, progressive in, in adopting the latest technology and integrating lots of virtualization in the network. I was super surprised that it wasn't SK Telecom, rather it was KT. And I'm not too familiar with KT, right? I mean, they're, aren't they, con they're not even considered in the top three from an operator perspective. Oh, no, they are. They're number are two. They? Are they number two? SKT, KT, and then LG. Got it. Okay. Well, I, I missed that one. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, the thing is, is that like both SKT and KT are very close partners of Samsung. In okay. fact, I think all three are. LG obviously is less so because Samsung is a competitor. Yeah. But the reality is Samsung's using Korea as their test market for a lot of technologies they are. and rolling those out to the rest of the world. And they've proven, you know, as they've won business with companies like Verizon, that they're very capable and that their technology works. So I think this is just gonna be a continuation for Samsung Network's continued growth into 5G and as a alternative to Nokia and Ericsson. Yeah, well, you know, Samsung's the home, homegrown hero in that market, right? So it makes sense that they would spread it around and, you know, and not play favorites to, you know, the shining star and SKT, right? So, uh, and, you know, maybe we'll see some sort of joint announcement with Samsung and, and, and LG Plus, right, you know, um, down the road. So, awesome. Well, it's been another great podcast, Angela. Why don't you take us home? Sure. We hope our viewers and listeners found this week's topics interesting. If anyone out there would like to provide us insight on a specific 5G topic they would like for us to cover in a future podcast, please reach out to us on social media. Will is at Will Town Tech, and I'm at Anshel Sog. We hope you... Have a great weekend and please tune again next week.